Mike Stewart, would you please stand and let's worship together.
I really appreciate you coming and worshiping with us uh, this morning. And uh, we got, got a camera stand this morning, and so we're, uh, I think, if it all worked well, we're live streaming on Facebook. So maybe some people who weren't able to get here this morning able to worship with us too. We're really glad that you're here. Um, if this is your first time, we're especially glad that you're here this morning and uh, that you braved the elements and came. Uh, if you, uh, in the back of your bulletin, would do us a favor, just give us a little information on the Connect card. You can take it to the welcome desk out in the lobby, or you can put it in the offer plate. You can take it to the desk in the lobby. Uh, we'll give you a free uh, coffee mug and chocolate this morning. So I uh, hope you'll uh, give us a little opportunity to get to know you a bit. We also have the opportunity to pray for you in the back that is a place for prayer requests, and we kind of an honor to do that as your staff. We do that on Mondays through a staff meeting, and we carry them with us uh, all week long. It really is an honor to get to pray with you. Um, I have two things to bring to your attention. First of all, on, uh, if you've been attending here for a while or you're relatively new and you're interested in learning more about the church, we have a Discover class happening on February the 10th, and you can see a place to sign up for that right here. Uh, and we'd love to, for you to learn about the church if you're interested in becoming a member of the church. And four members of the church. Uh, this morning, uh, we had a little business we got to attend to uh, this morning. Back uh, last May, our deacons uh, uh, nominated a committee that the church then affirmed at our May business meeting to look at our constitution and bylaws and to bring them up to date. And so in December at the church business meeting, they made that proposal. And it requires a month between there and the time that we vote on that. So we announced we'd be voting today. We've had two town hall meetings over the last uh, few weeks. And people came and asked questions and stuff. And on your uh, back of your tear-off today is a ballot. And so if you would just say that you affirm it or you don't want to, that's your deal. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to do that. Just put it in the offering plate when it comes by in a little while. The second thing is uh, we have two deacons uh, who are been deacons before and are rotating back on, but it takes your affirmation for that, and so they're on here as well. And so we're just going to take care of it this way this morning, and you can put those in the offer plate when it passes. All clear? If you didn't get a uh, bulletin, maybe during the next song you can zip out and grab your one and come back if you need one. Um, we're really glad you're here. It's good to have Zach back with us. I didn't get to be here the last time he was here, and um, he really looks happier today because his wife Katie's with him. <laughs> And uh, glad you braved it from Westerville to come down and worship with us today. Father, thank you for your incredible goodness and your grace and your mercy in our lives. Uh, thanks for protection to get to church this morning. I, I want to tell you thank you for those uh, men and women who've been out on the roads with the scrapers and the salters and making it possible for us to come and worship with you today. I pray you keep us safe even as we travel around a little bit today. Um, but God, we're here and we want to hear from you. We want to hear you speak to us, and God, um, you're worthy of all that we are, all that we have, and uh, so we lay our yes on the altar. So Lord, you speak to us, um, ask of us what you will, because you're worthy of our lives, and so we say yes, even before you ask the question today, draw us to you. Uh, God, we want to see you move in our hearts and our lives, we long for that, but not just in our lives, not just in our church. We long to see you sweep across this community, across our state, across our nation. Uh, Lord, that people would be drawn to Jesus Christ, who is our only hope. He is our Savior. And it's in his strong and powerful name we pray. Um, God's people said. Amen. <laughs>
after I arrived in Jerusalem. I'd been there three days. I got up at night. And I looked, uh, took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the one I was riding. I went out at night through the valley gate toward the serpent well and the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but farther down it became too hard, too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up at night by the way of the valley and inspected the wall. Then heading back, I entered through the valley gate and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. Kind of added a slide here next that um, actually has a, a map. Kind of imagined going around these walls and then not being able to go much further. It wasn't like it was a small city. It would have taken a while. Imagine being even at night that Nehemiah went to inspect what was going on. I, I can only imagine. Maybe maybe it was a clear night and you know, and he could see. And what really gets me is this this is a guy who had been praying for four months, weeping and mourning and fasting over it, and now he's gonna see it for the first time. Can can you imagine something you've never actually seen? He had never been to Jerusalem ever. He wasn't born there. He was born in captivity. He had never been to the city. He didn't even know what it used to look like. He didn't know what the temple used to look like. He didn't know any of that. But God had birthed such a burden in his heart for the city and for the people. And now here he is, riding around. And he can't even get through it all because of the rubble. Imagine the impact on him, the brokenness. It's kind of like for me, um, the first time I went to Nicaragua on a mission trip, I'd seen a few pictures. I'd heard a few stories. And I was burdened for the people. And God had put the burden on my heart to go there. I only had, I think, a, a, about two months time between the time I heard and decided to go. And, and the, the burden was there. And I still remember taking that bus down dirt roads across a little creek wondering if we're going to make it and pulling into the Paradise Barrio. I thought I knew what to expect. But as I pulled in and I saw stick huts with cardboard, that was it. And the burden for those people with whom I had been uh, partnering to pray and I'd been praying for them became such reality in my life. I can only imagine what it would have been for Nehemiah, the entire city. Place, not just he was burdened for the people and their plight physically, but he was burdened for the glory of God. That this place that was meant to be a beacon of light for the glory of God to the rest of the planet was now nothing but burnt gates and broken down walls. This is what I don't understand. For a guy who didn't even know what it looked like to then go and have people who had been there for years and not motivated to do anything. And yet Nehemiah saw more in the darkness than they were able to see in the light. And I would say to you this, when God puts a burden in your heart or a person for a school, for a place where you work, for a neighborhood where you live, for a community where you live, for a city. When God puts the burden there, you start seeing things. And I'm not talking about some of those commercials and things that talk about when people start seeing, you know, double and all that stuff. You, you just start noticing things, things you didn't notice before. A couple weeks ago, I challenged you about praying about some relationships in your life, and I gave you ten of them. 
And uh, somebody sent me an email yesterday and said, hey, it would be really helpful if maybe you could send those 10 back out again in an email or something to the church. So we're going to put it in the newsletter this week. But, but while I was reading that email, it was, it was at 3.30 this morning. I told our staff, I'm like, I really should stop saying things like this out loud about that God hasn't really burdened me that much to where I would stay awake at night. And now I'm up at 3.30, 4 o'clock every morning. God tends to do that kind of stuff in your life. But this morning when I woke up, um, I, I turned on the TV and I saw a commercial. Maybe, maybe you've seen the commercial. It's from the town of Denial, Ohio. Anybody seen it? it it's about drug addiction. And, but, but I think it was probably a picture of here that the people are like, there's no drug issue here in our town. Our kids don't have any issues. The people we work with, the people we're in town with, they don't have any issues, don't have any messes. And the reality of what the commercial was trying to say is, is you live in denial, Ohio. Because the issues are all around you. But the reality for us, and the reality for the people in Jerusalem, they've just gotten used to the mess. That's why their walls were broken down and the gates were burned. I just wonder, when's the last time you actually drove to work or drove to school and actually paid attention? When's the last time I did it? When's the last time I took a little different route to see what's really happening in our city? When's the last time you drove to the other side of town to a place to eat and went somewhere different? Instead of the places you always go with the people you always see. One of the things that I encourage people about going on mission trips with, uh, but the reason I encourage them is not just to help the missionary, the church planter, because what happens is, is your eyes get open and you start looking at things differently. You start seeing things differently. I have a good friend named Eddie, and uh, Eddie went on a mission trip to San Diego from South Carolina. And Eddie had been in church all his life. His wife was the church pianist. They had been in church all their life. And Ed, Eddie went on a mission trip to San Diego. He hung out with the church planter for a few days. And, and he started going to fast food restaurants because church planters eat lots of fast food. You'll get that later. Um, and, and so they could go to some fast food restaurants and you would ask, well, why do you go here? Well, I, I try to stop here once a week because I, and they would walk in and they would talk to the people at the counter and call them by name. See, this was their community. Eddie came home and the next week we were having a meeting after church on Sunday and we almost always went to the KFC because it was the closest place and you could get the $5 box lunch. Y'all get the $5 box lunch, right? Well, Eddie said, I'll, pick up, I'll go pick up the lunches today. So he goes to KFC and he picks up the lunches. Eddie's lived in this town for over 40 years. Eddie comes back and he's sitting at the table. And we kind of start going around talking about the issues, and when I got to Eddie, he couldn't speak. He began to weep. This is a this is a dude who does maintenance in a power plant. I used to work in a power plant. I know these people. And he begins to weep. He finally got his composure back. And he said, I went to pick up lunch today. He said, I can't tell you probably the hundreds of times I've been in that restaurant. He said, but because I went on the mission trip and I watched Pastor Kevin and how he interacted, he said, I noticed the person behind the counter's name tag. And I just called him by name and asked him how the day was going. He said, I've never called anyone by name in that place before. 
he said, that person behind the counter started telling me some of their day and some of what had, gone, had happened in their life. What a burden they had. I, don't, I can't remember what it was, but it was enough to make a 60 year old maintenance guy from a power plant sit in a room and weep. And he prayed with that person. Here's what he said. He said, I'll never go in a restaurant the same again. I'll never go in again the same. He said, this is my town. And I have no idea what goes on. I just go on my route. I never go in a different way. I never look at it in a different way. I just get into the rut of my life. There are people all around me who need Jesus. And he said, I got to tell them about how good Jesus was to me. He said, I would have never thought about doing that in KFC. Sometimes what God does is when you, when you go a little different route, you just survey a little different. You look around a little different. You approach things just a little different. God gives you somebody who encourages you more than you could have ever encouraged them. I was praying not too long ago about, uh, God, would you give me the chance to talk to you, share the gospel today? And um, I went to our home, this big building, and the well guy, they called me and said, can you stop out here? The well guy's going to come and wants you to tell him where the well goes. And so I went and met him. And we got to the end of that. And we're walking out the door, up the little gravel driveway to where Corey's truck was. I'm like, Lord, is this the opportunity you want for me to share with him? You know what? Corey turned to me and shared the entire gospel in about 30 seconds. <laughs> and as excited as I was about him telling me about Jesus, I'm like, I'm not telling him. I'm a believer, nor am I telling him I'm a pastor. He's having too much fun with this. <laughs> and I thought, why did he beat me to it? You with me? See, Corey had looked at his day, and I found out that he doesn't normally go on these visits. There was somebody else with him who normally does, and for some reason he jumped in the truck today. I don't want to go see customers with you today. Come down to the company. Listen, that's what happens when you start surveying the scene. And you start looking at your town. You start looking at your neighborhood. You start looking at it just a little differently. I got to have a Jesus conversation this morning before church at Walmart with Gabby. That was the fair field game. She knows Jesus. But see, i got to live with this. I'm, I knew I was about to come tell you this stuff. That, that it's like Jesus is like, so what are you going to do with it at Walmart at 9 o'clock this morning? <clears throat> Just get your thing and get out, right? Get on your way? And then God says, you need to say something to her. How about you? One leader principle here. Listen. Nehemiah didn't just see the problems, he saw the potential. But here's the thing about a leader leaders are often awake when others are asleep and working when others are resting. See, while some people are zip, 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 round, you, you might take the eye. I want to go an extra five minutes early so I can go a different route. I want to drive by that middle school and pray. I want to drive by that elementary school on my way. Just It's a little out of my way, but I want to just pray for these people. Second, we see Nehemiah share the vision. He shared the vision. I don't know why he didn't share it up front. Why didn't he just roll into town and say, I'm here to be the Savior. Because he wasn't there to be the Savior. 
He got sent by the Savior. Listen to what he said in verse 17. So I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? He didn't say, did you see the trouble you are in? He said, did you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild the Jerusalem's wall so that we may no longer be a disgrace. I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been upon me and what the king had said to me. And they said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened or encouraged to do this good work. Nehemiah didn't sugarcoat the reality. He told them in reality what a mess they were in. But he said, we're in a mess. I'm with you. That's one of the things about being pastor and moving to a town. You, you've got to own it. You, you've got to know what's going on. And sometimes what happens is you live there all your life and you don't know what's going on. The reality of the circumstances was a genuine mess. And I love this. His call to action wasn't just to build a wall that some other empire could tear down. He talked about the disgrace that they were in. And that's not about them personally. See, they were supposed to represent the glory of God to the world. The good news that there is a God that is faithful that they can trust. They were supposed to represent that to the world. And what they were representing was defeat. And then he shares the story of how God's plan, how God had provided his I mean, they knew who Artaxerxes was. They knew that Artaxerxes was the one who stopped the building the first time. They knew what a risk it would be to even approach him. And then to see God change his heart. And to see God not only change his heart to allow it to happen, but to change his heart to say, I'm going to provide for it to happen. And I'm going to protect the process this time. And I'm not sending somebody over here to be kind of the leader who doesn't have your heart and your best interest in mind. I'm sending Nehemiah. He's the governor. Made him governor. And provided the motivation for people who had experienced nothing but defeat and failure before. Visionary leaders must encourage trust in God by leading them in faith as well as in action. Lead people to trust God, not just to do something. See, that's, that's what lasts with us. Nehemiah would die. And the people needed something to know to trust God, not Nehemiah. You see, it's even as parents, that's what happens to us. Some of us as parents who grew up the way I grew up, it's like, why should I do that? Because I told you so. Why should I not do that? Because I told you so. Did they grow up like that? And sometimes you've got to say that because they just want the baby. But how much would it benefit our children and our grandchildren in the long haul to say, let me explain to you God's best plan from God's word for why we should and shouldn't. And trust God. And when you trust God, you see God be faithful. And even when we mess it up, God is still faithful. In Philippians, the Apostle Paul said, even when I'm faithless, he's faithful. We trust, we teach people to trust God. We teach our kids to trust God, not just to trust us. And Nehemiah appointed them to trust in God. And then at the end here, in the last couple of verses, Nehemiah silences the distractions. Silences the distractions. When Sam Bounds and Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshe the Arab heard about this, they mocked and despised us and said, What is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Well, they knew they were rebelling against the king because he had letters telling them to do it. But that had worked before. That was the argument that worked before. They're the ones who had said word to the king that the people were rebuilding and were going to rebel against them. And so they go for what they know is the weak spot. 
Nehemiah, I gave him this reply, verse 20. The God of heavens is the one who will grant us success. I mean, interesting that it didn't say Artaxerxes gave us permission. Here's the letter. He didn't do that. The God of heaven is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start building. But you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. He says, I don't have any room for distractions. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is later in Nehemiah. When they try to distract him again, and Nehemiah is going to say, I'm doing a good work on the wall, and I cannot <coughs> come down. There's one thing you don't want to do when you meet distractions or even opposition. The reality is you don't want to debate it, and that's what we normally want to do. We want to win an argument. Nehemiah chooses not to debate them. And he chooses not to ignore them. You can't ignore opposition or distractions. So he addresses them. One of the things that we have to be really confident about, though, is there are going to be distractions. Sometimes there are going to be distractions just because, not, not because there's opposition, but because there's just confusion. And so we have to clarify. Y'all play the telephone game? You sit in a circle and you say one thing and the person next to you, you whisper in the air and you get all the way around the circle. And sometimes by the time it comes back, it's totally different. So there is confusion in communication. Sometimes there has to be clarification and communication. But when somebody obviously has a motive that wants to destroy, not to build, you've got to address it. You've got to address it. Nehemiah did. I wrote, read this statement this week. Anyone can live as a destroyer, but God has called his people to be builders. We gotta focus on the mission. Focus on the mission. Sometimes we need clarifying voices. So, sometimes we need clarifying voices in our lives, in our ministries. My friend Dino taught me this, and so I'm gonna risk it here. I'm gonna risk it really big here. I need five volunteers. I need five volunteers. I promise I will not embarrass you, but I need, I need five volunteers who will come up here and do an illustration of me. Y'all drove to church in the snow this morning. This is not that bad. Yeah, I think. Great. Danny, stay in the middle. Come on. Come on. That's okay. So, so the rest of you, uh, stand around him. One of you in the back, maybe one on that step, one on the side here. Someone go all the way in the back. Somebody come here. All right. So imagine Dan is Nehemiah. Imagine all the distractions that Dan's going to face trying to build a wall in a city in on three years. Imagine. God's been birthed in his heart for six months now. He knows what we're supposed to do. But the people around him probably don't know exactly what we're supposed to do. And imagine their response to this. So you're Nehemiah's wife. You're, you're saying about it. Only for a minute. Man, you can be <laughs> um, you, you, you happen to be one of the people who were on the trip with him. And now you've seen the walls. I, I think you're probably Ezra. You're the prophet. You're in town. You've been here for a little while. And, and you're, you're, you're one of the timber guys. So you've got all this wood now that's come. And you're going to have to... So you've been on this 
overnight kind of little excursion with Nehemiah. You're the team. Imagine the things you might say to Nehemiah. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to take just about 10 seconds. I want you to think about the one thing you would say to Nehemiah. If you're his wife, if you're Sam Ballot, the person I told you, okay? One thing you would say, and I want you to say it really loud, over and over and over, and you got to take it. Ready? Are you ready? I want you to watch this. Watch this. Ready? Set. Go. It has been more saved. Sometimes we need to revisit answered prayer. 
Because sometimes God answers to our prayers now are waiting. We're waiting. And we just need to revisit the fact that He had, He does answer. I know He answers. We need to recall His provision. As my friend Dr. Johnny Hunt said to me one time, after talking to me, I was discouraged and we're out on the golf course. He invited our family to come to Georgia and he took me to play golf. And we're standing on the first tee waiting to tee off. And he's asking me about what's going on in my life. And I've told him a couple of stories about how God has provided. He's asking me, tell me one story about how God did provide. Tell me one story about when God did show up. Tell me one story. And sometimes we need to revisit when God provided in ways that we couldn't understand to remind ourselves that God is always the provider. And I was able to reflect in my mind to that little church office in Durham, North Carolina when our house payment in Ohio was still due and we had no money. And Lisa was pregnant with number three and we had no insurance. And right before the house payment was due. There was an envelope handed to me with 10 $100 bills in it. Well, that doesn't happen very often. I can't remember it ever happening like that. Again, but it did happen. You know what? Here's what he said to me. Dr. Hunt said this to me. You can always stand in the pulpit with credibility and say, I know God provides because he has for me. And some of you are in a position right now where you're like, I'm not sure how we're going to make it. And you have to be reminded of the fact that God has provided in the past and He doesn't change. Encouraged and discouragement. I know this is a relatively trying statement. It, you, might, you might say, Pastor, that's just ridiculous that you would say that. But let me just say this. I read it this week and God said, say it to you. So I'm going to give it to you. The R. Edmund wrote this. It's always too soon to quit. It's always too soon to quit. God hasn't quit on you. It's always too soon to quit. I'll give you two things and we're done. God's name is not at stake as a result of a wall or a city, but in your life and mine. Now, God's not found. As Jesus told the woman in the well, He said, there's going to come a day when it's not about a temple, it's not about a city, it's not about a place, it's about me alive and you worshiping me because I'm in you. God's glory is at stake in your life and my life. Nehemiah's mission was to restore Jerusalem to an environment that pleased God. It wasn't about building a wall. It was about way more than a wall. And God's working to restore our broken lives into ones that are pleasing to Him. And the truth is, is that most of us have gates and walls that are broken. Where the enemy's getting in. And if you're here this morning and you're a follower of Christ, can I just say to you that all of us have times when there's a wall broken down. There's a gate that's been burned. The enemy keeps punching into that spot. Trying to distract you with that. And, and God wants to rebuild the wall. And God used Nehemiah to do that in Jerusalem. And sometimes God does uses people to do it in your life and my life. And what we do is we resist that. We, especially guys. We say we can fix that ourselves. And the truth is we can't fix it ourselves. We need help. And God sends someone to help us. God sends someone to quiet the voices around us and to speak truth into our lives. And we're like, well, I can fix that myself. You know what that is? P R I D E. Pride. God wants to restore the broken walls and the broken gates and the burned gates in our lives. And, and we've got to allow other people to help us that God sends to us so that we can hear the voice of God amidst the clutter and the distractions. To help us revisit God's faithfulness in the past. To help us revisit our calling, what God's called us to. And if you're here this morning and you're a follower of Christ, maybe you need to go revisit what God's called you to do. And like, I'm frustrated with that. I'm burned out with that. Well, God hasn't changed. We all go through seasons, and maybe there's something else that God wants you to do. 
the bit. You just wouldn't know what it is because you just got all this clutter going on. All these voices going on. God's not a God of confusion. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says that. He's not the author of confusion. God wants clarity in our lives. So sometimes we need to take a different route. Sometimes we need to turn the radio off while we're driving and let God speak. Sometimes we need to take a walk. Sometimes we need to allow ourselves to be in community with other people and let them past the walls so they can speak in our lives. I don't know what it is, but I, I can tell you this out of personal experience and out of the truth of God's word. None of us are going to be perfect until we get to heaven. And so there's always going to be a broken wall somewhere that needs God's charm to build for his glory and for our good. There's always going to be a gate that Satan is attacking. And the question is this morning for you as if you're a believer is Will you let God rebuild the wall, restore the gate, and stop saying, I can fix it myself? Me and mine never thought he could rebuild the wall. He said, the hand of God is on me, and God will make us successful. And the reality, if you're here this morning, you're not yet a believer, you're not a follower of Christ, is the, the sin that separates us from God is pride. I don't need you. I can do this myself. I got a better plan for my life than you do. And the reality is that all of us are born into sin and we sin by nature and by choice. And, and we're broken. And we need God. And maybe in this message this morning, God, in His own way, He has come to you and said, Your life's broken like that wall of Jerusalem. It's only the hand of God that's going to do it. And He gave a way to do that. He gave His Son Jesus to die on the cross, pay a penalty for your sin and my sin. And it's only by faith and trusting in Jesus Christ that we regain a relationship with God by having our sins forgiven. That's the only way that we get it. And it's the way I got it back in June 1970. Everyone in here who's a follower of Christ didn't get it by something they did. They get it did it accepting and believing what God did. And God wants to not just rebuild you. The Bible says that when we trust Christ, that He makes us new. You're like, well, God couldn't do anything with the brokenness in my life. God doesn't need the brokenness of your life. You need to let Him sweep that out and give you something totally new in Jesus. That's what it is. You want to even recognize that the people around you are no right what God does. And so I invite you this morning. As we revisit the incredible price that Christ paid for us, I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. And we're going to go home. Jesus died for our brokenness, not for our righteousness. He died to come address our brokenness, not our righteousness, because we had none to offer. So, Respond this morning. If you want to come and kneel at the altar, it's a, it's a safe place. It's an open place. If you want someone to pray with you, it's an honor to be able to do that. I'd be happy to do that. There are plenty of people around here who would. There's a friend, someone in that file with you who would love to come pray with you. If you want someone to follow up with you this week, uh, you can. there's a place on the slip out there, or there's one in the back of your seat there. We, we will follow up with you this week. Listen, let God. Rebuild the brokenness in your life. Rebuild the wall. Rebuild the wall. It is an environment, a place that's pleasing to Him and honors Him. And it's for your good and your best. Father, thank you for the incredible gift of mercy and grace that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray this morning, God, that we would say yes to allowing you to rebuild the broken down places in our lives, to burn gates in our lives. God, would you give us the courageous faith to trust you, to lay down pride and say, I need help. Lord, for that person who needs to trust Christ, I pray they would do that today.